It's panel time. Get ready for some action, people. We've got an exciting panel coming up for you. Uh, we are going to be talking about innovation and the connection to financing and entrepreneurship because it is challenging. There's a lot of innovation that goes unfunded and people have been trying to find solutions to this. And there's a number of new things that are on the way. ICOs, uh, the professionalization of angel investment, which the WBAF is playing a role, for example, for the WBAF Business School, and other and looking in particular where financing has not worked at the early stage, for example, in equity uh, financing issues have really become prominent in recent days. And we've got a panel that's going to come and discuss some of these issues now. Uh, we've got our moderator is in the room and ready for action. And I think we're going to keep, is it, we'll have time and we'll allow people to ask questions, yes? We will. Oh, great. It's an intimate group, so we'd like to welcome Mutasem Mizmar, the Senior Advisor to the World Bank and IFC, and welcome him to the stage as he is going to be moderating our panel. So, there we go. Mutasem, thank you very much. I will I'd like to welcome a group uh, from a little bit closer to my part of the world, Dr. Alex Lim. He is the Deputy CEO of Intuitive in Singapore. He's going to be joining us right up here. He comes off to my right. Thank you very much. Uh, the Intuitive is spelled a little differently, N-T-U, and that's for Nanyang Technical University in Singapore, where I have a little bit of personal background that I'll tell you about over drinks if you uh, buy me a couple tonight. Paulo Andres is the President Emeritus of Eman. He was also an investor of Toys R Us, uh, IB, and he has come to us from Portugal. Thank you very much. And uh, Paulo, I don't think I'm speaking out of class to say that you're also involved in environmental technologies as well. Is that right? Yes, as well. So that's something else to have on your radar for him. We'd also like to welcome all the way from Colombia, who might have been the most excited person to uh, become a uh, senator last night, was Rene Rojas, founder of Hub BLG Angel Investment Club Colombia. Very good. Very excited to get his picture taken with his Argentinian compatriot uh, last night from Latin America. So, Murasem, you ready for action? This panel is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, it's so wonderful to have you here and also to have our esteemed panelists to address something that is very important and challenging these days. As you know, that changes is happening so rapidly in this world especially in the technological side and what effect it's having on our each and each individual single life actually we find ourselves that we need to learn unlearn and relearn we find ourselves that we need to upskill and reskill we find ourselves that we need to enable ourselves and be able ourselves in order to cope with these changes that is taking place and affecting each and every one of us. Actually, this is making it like innovation and innovators will be, or I think they are now, the main drivers for the world's economy growth and having them or encouraging them for more innovation will be a, a great responsibility over all of our shoulders. On that, I welcome our dear panelists to hear from you and to hear your views about how can we address such challenges and uh, I'll be opening the ground for the uh, esteemed audience also to ask questions and we'll be ready for answering that, inshallah. Um, so, one of the major issues now is maybe access to finance in such a uh, rapidly changing environment. I would like to see your views on such challenges. And uh, how would you see that we should address these challenges? And what challenges do you see? And what are the views on facing these challenges? I'll uh, start with uh, Mr. Andres. 
Thank you um, for the question. I think it's uh, a great question. I think that um, when we talk about the, the funding gap, we are talking about uh, one single thing, is about the risk. So why people, why banks do not give loans to, to startups or to innovative companies? Why investors do not invest in, um, in these companies? There are two studies uh, worldwide that uh, I think are, are really interesting to understand this, uh, this issue. One study is um, uh, a study done by IBAN, the European Business Angel Network, it was uh, 2018, and um, they surveyed uh, more than 600 investors, and they asked them uh, the reasons why they didn't invest in some of the, the investments that they refused. And um, probably many, a lot of people would think that the main reason is that the, the project uh, was not uh, scalable, um, there was not uh, the, the rate of return would not be uh, good in terms of the what is written in the paper. Now, the first reason is that the project had too many risks. It's about the risk. And the second reason was the valuation. And the, the, the risk, the, the, the project that would not have enough uh, scalability or would not have a good rate of return in terms of what was written in the paper was only 7%. So it was not the main problem. So if we want to, to fix this funding gap, we need to reduce the risk. And the problem is that the entrepreneurs and the innovators, they come with a lot of risk. And the investors do not want to accept that risk. And of course, there are two types of uh, risk. is the perception and the real risk. And I think that sometimes the entrepreneurs think that the investors know everything about their activity, their, their field, and there is a need to um, de-bias and to help the investors to understand what is behind that. Actually, uh, talking about risk here, some people see, or some opinions see that startup businesses or startup inventors are a high risk. Some other opinions see that it is a different risk. So, what is your views on these two opinions? If I move to Mr. Lin here. But, uh, it, is, it is always uh, constantly a conflict between the entrepreneurs, the startup, as well uh, against the investor, because they are from both sides, uh, uh, two different sides. The key challenge is how to put the two sides become the same side. Because that, uh, always, that, um, I would say the media will constantly emphasize on the fundraising. You always talk about fundraising, that who raised how much, and this is what the media is uh, obsessed with. So, so you largely have a lopsided view of what is actually going on. So uh, Paula mentioned about the risk. The key, the key thing about risk is not actually risk, it's actually about communication. When the two sides are not able to understand each other, then they start second guessing each other. Right, for example, that uh, entrepreneurs always talk about how good his business is, how good he is, but he will never tell the, uh, the investor that how is he able to make money for the investor. Well, the investor is only interested to see how can you help me to make money. So there's a communication, huge communication gap down there that two sides is not talking on the same term. So when the entrepreneur is able to explain to the investor, say, look, if you give me a dollar here, in 18 months it will be $10. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to hire how many salespeople, I'm going to do this, I'm going to give what kind of scale. And if you're able to explain that down, the investor most of the time is able to accept it. Now the key thing is that the one of the very, very major uh, disconnect most of people do not see is that, in, I just take Singapore for example. In Singapore, the whole Asia, the whole uh, ASEAN, just on ASEAN alone, they are all together at least $36 billion uh, this uh, fund under management, which means that these are liquidity from VC. But last year, we only deployed less than 12 billion. That's including about 4 billion is raised by a unicorn. Now, when you start looking at this one, is that there's at least another 70% of money not deployed. There cannot be no money. It's in fact, there are more money looking for good projects. 
So that is a, the kind of gap, that there is kind of misperception, there's a kind of miscommunication that currently happening. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to something, that to gap or to, to, to bridge this gap in com communication. I think that needs a kind of capacity building. So now the investors are solely focused on building or, the, or, or investing and putting money in a project. But would you think that investing in building the capacity of the entrepreneur or the startup business owner will also be a kind of investment that will generate income to that investor or not, and will bridge this kind of gap that Dr. Lin has just raised. Mr. Thank you very much, thank you. and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I think uh, the gap between uh, entrepreneurs and investors is, 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 is really communication, but behind, if you're going deep, startups uh, does, a, a, a traditional startup does not recognize the exponential chain. Mm -hmm. We are in the middle of uh, exponential chain, the technology chain, and we have to use the technology to create a company in any sector, agricultural, mining, all the sectors in the economy. And in that way, the capacities that you have to uh, increase in the team that is, is creating a company is so important. It's very important. It's not necessarily the traditional uh, uh, skills that we teach in the MBA programs or in a, in a business school. It's more soft skills and, and the, the more than traditional skills that you you have to uh, uh, create the capacity in the teams. Teams and people are the big asset. The, the main asset in a, in a startup is the people. And people is not thinking in the exponential way. If you are not, not thinking in the exponential way, you cannot create exponential startup. If you are not creating exponential startups, you are not invested. You are not ready, uh, ready to be invested. Because if you don't use that technology or the, and, and that thinking, you are creating a traditional startup, which just 10% profitability yearly, which is not good enough to assume the risk to invest in high risk, which is startups. Startups is high risk. We have to mitigate, but don't reduce the risk. We have to mitigate risk. That means uh, calculate the risk. But if you reduce the risk, the profitability going down, which is not the business. The business is high risk, high profitability. We have to move in that way using exponential technologies, using blockchain, big data, uh, 3D printing, that sort of technologies that we have to use to create companies in traditional sectors, in agriculture, in mining, in all the traditional sectors. We don't, uh, we, 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 we cannot continue creating companies uh, from 80s or 90s uh, acceleration methodologies and traditional methodologies. We need new methodologies to create startups. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rojas. Well, actually, this brings to my mind that the success rate in startups globally is still be below ambitions. I don't have an exact figure, but in, in the best cases, it didn't reach more than 20%. So this brings uh, uh, another point, is that the focus you have uh, really uh, focused on. Would you see that this would, this would be directed towards increase, increasing the success rate or, or decreasing the failure rate, which in my opinions are two different things, two different variables. So I would like to hear your views on that, gentlemen. Uh, please. 
I think that um, when we talk about um, capacity building, I think we need to change the way uh, capacity building is done today. Because what is uh, capacity building in the most part of the cases is uh, helping the entrepreneur to pitch better to investors so that he can talk the same language as investors. Does this help to reduce the risk? I don't think so. Because um, if uh, usually I don't see an entrepreneur coming to me with a freedom to operate statement saying that his company is not infringing any patent. He can understand what is a BTA, what are the rate of return of the company, but it doesn't bring me something that is critical for me is to see if he's infringing any patent. So, and he doesn't bring. So, uh, helping him to pitch better to me would be better if he brings me documents that proves to reduce the risk. The second thing that uh, usually um, an entrepreneur uh, also doesn't uh, doesn't uh, bring is if he has a technology, if that technology will work. So he should bring me a statement from a, a certified mm -hmm. entity showing that all the the num all the technology that is there has some chance, good chance of happening. And what I see in many cases when I receive un uh, some technologies that I don't understand uh, technically, I send to some uh, universities that I trust, and the universities tell me, oh, this is um, a lot of flaws here, and I don't invest. But but he pitches very well to me. He knows exactly what I'm looking for. But behind, there is nothing. And this is the risk. So we need the capacity building to help entrepreneurs to mitigate risk. If we don't have capacity building mitigating risk, there is nothing that we are going to do in, re in reality to improve this. And then we have the failure rates that you are mentioning, and people get even more afraid to invest in startups. So. If I would ask you, are you ready to invest in capacity building? I think that uh, the capacity building, there is a lot of money in the market. Um, let's talk about grants in Europe. That is something that uh, I know. So how are grants um, being deployed? Free money to entrepreneurs. They do a pitch. They, they write a very nice proposal, usually some, um, some uh, consultants that uh, write very nice proposal. There are some evaluators that basically have two hours to evaluate 33 pages, do the report, do the analysis uh, of freedom to operate, etc., etc. So it's not really uh, good. But they, these, um, these grants do not invest one single euro helping the entrepreneur to get the documents of freedom to operate, IP, if the IP is really registered or not. And I think in case of Europe, if the grant system is shifted from giving grants to the companies and helping them before to, to reduce the risk and understand better where they are, then it will be better. I think it's not the role of an investor to invest in capacity building. If there is a, a market gap, I think it's the, um, the states that uh, need to do that. Oh, all right. Thank you. Uh, very fruitful. Well, well, how do you foresee the consequences of the current type of investment? Uh, are we really investing the right way or should we do some changes just to cope with the changes that are going on? You really look at that the whole situation is that it depends on whether your ecosystem is mature or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in an immature ecosystem, there's always, there isn't a trust between the entrepreneur and investor because each one is trying to game each other. So you, you will see that um, from across the world, most of the time is that entrepreneurs trying to pull a fast one, investors trying to figure out whether his money is going elsewhere or not. So there's always a mistrust to, to start with. The, the, as I mentioned, is that how can you start bringing the entrepreneurs and investors both to the same side? Because after the money is in, they have to work together to make the money, the company better. So they can never start from an opposing side. Right, so evaluating uh, uh, investment is not, not, not always about, I'm trying to figure out whether are you trying to cheat me or not. So, so a lot of time, this is where the ecosystem are they mature. In a not mature ecosystem, that's what we see most of the time. But in a mature ecosystem, slowly people begin to realize that. Uh, 
uh, investor usually will work together with the um, entrepreneur startup and say, look, let's look at your business. How are you going to get there? Are you having the right things? Are you having all things? It's basically working backward from how the investment go in, eventually can achieve that kind of growth you want to. Um, whichever growth that you are looking for, it could be directly about valuation increase, it can also be just about uh, SDG, Social uh, uh, Sustainability Development Goal Achievement. So, so all these things are literally is between investor and the startup to do it together. Now, in the whole process of being, uh, doing all these things, the entrepreneurs the ecosystem learn at the same time. So although it is right that most of the time people will refer to, let's say, a government or ecosystem developer and say that, please educate the ecosystem. Typically, a university is being asked to do that, and um, maybe some of the government departments is being asked to do that. Now, university, even though I'm from university, but university is not the right organization to do that for a very simple reason. Most of the professors are non-practitioner. So they, they literally do not know about entrepreneur ecosystem because they know the theory, they might not be very practical about it. And a lot of time it's a lot of trial and error. Those people who build the ecosystem will eventually know. So when you put the question back about um, building the capacity first or building, uh, doing investment first, ultimately these two are always working together. It is a constant um, rolling together. I mean, in Singapore, our situation is that when we first started, our success rate is only about 1%. It's that low. Yeah, it is terrible for a very simple reason, because you, you build something and be able to build a product, the success rate between 3 and 8%. And bringing it to the market, you're about 10%, 11%. You combine the two together, you have 0.8%, just less than 1%. But what we did is that we took the market access first and educate, run accelerator. We bring the success rate up to about between 62 to 87 percent, and that go into incubation about 70 percent. Now you combine these two from zero to Series A, we got 40 percent success rate. That's the reason why Singapore ecosystem all of a sudden within two years we go from ranking number 17 go up to ranking number 10. That is that kind of concerted effort. Both the investor, both the educators, both the accelerator, government, everybody work together. So that is what the change is. Well, thank you, Dr. Lin. Mr. Rojas, I would like to uh, hear your views about this point in particular, because you are coming from a different background and different uh, area. So what do you think? Thank you. Um, I think uh, the failure rate and the investment point of view uh, is very, very, very interesting. Uh, we have accelerated in Hubbock more than 300 companies, and the survival rate is 76%. Many people ask me, why? What did you do? We unlearned everything we learned in the business school business plans, marketing, research, that sort of tools that are for traditional companies and for big companies. Big companies use that and it's right, but the startups don't have to use that. Please don't use, I used to say to the startups, use new tools. You can do a canvas in just two hours, not in six months. You don't need three months to, to build a very wonderful and surprising biz, uh, uh, business plan, which is only theory. Theory is very bad for startups. Startups have to create and surprising with the innovation. Innovation is, it cannot be a strategic plan. You cannot include an innovation plan in a strategic plan. In that way, you put limit to the innovation. Where the innovation come from? From the market. You have to discover in the market what, what, what is the market need today, not in 10 years, not in five years, not uh, before. You need right now what is happening in the market and discover the innovation. And in that way, you reduce the, the rate of failure. 
that that is, is, is not is not easy I know but if you use social networks if you use Facebook Instagram LinkedIn uh, Twitter you can discover the problem you can uh, uh, make a hypothesis of what is the problem in the market the market respond to you with likes shares comments or that sort of uh, uh, account, uh, accounted, uh, accountable uh, metrics and you can discover the problem and then create a solution and you can move very quick when the when the results coming up and grow in the exponential way investor should be there you have to wake the the eyes of the investors and say hey I discover a micro problem. I have a macro solution. Everything is hypothesis. It's a, a minimum viable product, but it's working well. But you have to come, put your money, and raise the technology, raise the market, raise everything. That's in the way that you can really reduce the failure rate and mitigate the risk because otherwise you are creating companies very old style companies you cannot be with that zombies because many many companies uh, the behavior is like a zombie you know this is just it is it's, it's passing the time it's not really changing the rules and we have to change the rules well thank you mr rojas that, um Mr. Andres said that this is, it is not the role of the investor to invest in capacity building. Do you share that point of view or you have another point of view personally? And this is only personally. I think that investing in capacity building is a type of investment that will create income as well as investing in a project. And personally, also, I'm trying to quantify that. I'm working on it. But I also would like to hear your esteemed point of views so I can, or everyone can have a better idea on how people or how the world is looking at such a type of investment. Dr. Lim, maybe you can provide your views, please. I totally agree with you in terms of uh, investing in capacity. The question is that taking what form? Um, a lot of time people will think that uh, being an investor, so I do invest in accelerator, so accelerator actually build capacity. So that is one form of doing it, but we realize that the the best way of doing is actually giving the entrepreneur a chance and guiding them along the way. So it's a little bit like mentorship, but in a done it in a very unstructured way. So I give you an example that um, we were working with uh, United Nations about SDG um, because that a lot of places fail SDG, including Singapore, right? So we're failing miserably. So what we did is that we work with a group of young people, and the young people, they, they are very passionate and they are angry with the old people like us and say that we are not doing anything. So I said, okay, that's fine. How about we help you to create business that look after SDG? But the condition is that I will only kickstart you. That means I only give you seed money, but you have to be sustainable. If you cannot create a sustainable model, forget about it. I'm not going to be, do it as a charity. So uh, with this model, what happened is that 17 groups created and they start working on SDG, each one, one category. And surprisingly, that um, the business succeed. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say surprisingly, but business succeed. And when they succeed, okay, as an investor, I do get a lot of return out of it, even though I'm not looking at the return initially. We put 50 million out there, we just say that we're going to write it off anyway. But the surprising thing they say is not. So the capacity is being built. Now the interesting thing is as you go beyond that because a young group of 17 of them, now they are infecting, I use the term infecting, that other country people. And I say that why not you start looking at your country, I will teach you how to do it. If you need money, come talk to Alex and his foundation and maybe we'll pull some resources from your United Nations to do it. And things will move on its own. The capacity is being built in this process and it is not done as a structure courses or anything. It's, it's just practical things, it's just going on this way. So I do agree that we need to start looking at a very responsible way of investing by looking at how can we build capacity at the same time. 
not just looking at financial return. Because that somehow, when the capacity is being built, the financial return automatically come to us. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Mr. Rojas, I'm eager to hear from you. Yes, I, I, I think that it's another, another way to increase the capacity in, team, in, the, in projects are increasing the team uh, in, in different talents because uh, we, we try to develop the talent in one, two guys, yes, and, and teaching a lot of things and maybe do workshops and several uh, teaching uh, instruments or methodologies. But you can increase and do a team building. Team building is so important. Uh, networking events, but not beer and pizza. No, it's not really the way to do networking because pizza and beer is, is every day. But you can do methodologies, so you can create methodologies just to make connections, rich connections, very good connections, and they can open the equity just to share the equity with other funders, other people. It's so important to add talent into one project. It's not only the way to increase the, the capacity in one, two guys. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for expressing these uh, precious new views, and I will leave the ground now for our esteemed audience. Number one, you said uh, risk. Number two, valuation. Okay, uh, what do you think? It may be the main reasons why uh, investors and entrepreneurs do not agree on evaluation. U.S. evaluation methodology. It's uh, very, very easy to answer that question. So how do the valuations are done by entrepreneurs? Usually they create a business plan and then they go to a bank or to uh, uh, a certified uh, chartered account and uh, they do discount cash flows based on this plan. So my question is, uh, five years ago, do you know any entrepreneur that has pitched to you and the project has e happened exactly how it was uh, projected? Of course not. So all the business plans are wrong. All the business plans are wrong. So how is possible, and that some universities also teach this to the students, that based on wrong data as an input, there is a miracle process that gives a good valuation. This does not exist. And we are teaching entrepreneurs this model. And so they think when they come to an investor, because they have a business plan that will uh, will have five million euros profit in the next five years, and entrepreneurs are asking for a valuation of 25 million euros, they get shocked when the investor says, are you crazy, 25 million euros? And because they think that we are trying to take advantage of the entrepreneurs, they don't understand the, the, the process. So the only way that you can um, mitigate the risk of the valuation is not to talk about speculation, but to talk about reality. So if the project will have these revenues or these profits, then the valuation is this one. If the project will have this, then the valuation is, is that one. And this is a model that is not well taught in the universities, and very, very few um, capacity builders in the market help entrepreneurs to do this in this way. Thank you, Mr. Andres. I'm afraid we are running out of time. Yeah, of course, shares can change. Uh, there is a depending on the revenue, depending on the on the on the profit. Um, you can also uh, do a convertible uh, notes. That's another way to, to do it a little bit better. But uh, um, we we could talk all, all the day. Uh, I deliver a workshop on risk mitigation for for startups, and uh, one of the things that uh, I talk just one morning, full morning, is about the valuation and how how to mitigate the risk of the investor based on that. Thank you, Mr. Andres. We're running out of time. We have a question from His Excellency, Dr. Nama. Uh, uh, 
it is more an addition rather a question, thank you for all your remark. Let's not also forget about the science-based startups. Most of the models that exist today, they are on what I call everyday startups and innovation, everyday innovation, uh, where they solve current problem and that there is a lot of value on that. But also there is a lot of research in the universities where they stop in the, in the scale of maturity level, they stay at level four, where they stop at the lab. And we need to look into that, how to get them out of the lab to become a startup. There is not enough, in my view, um, money and focus on that. And hence, the, probably, the, uh, the, um, this forum at WBAF with science technology, to link science technology with the startup world. Thank you, Your Excellency. We have room for more. Please, Your Highness. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I totally agree that we don't need business plans because, you know, when we need to take our science from lab <coughs> to the market, we uh, others they look at the uh, business plans and, uh, as you said, you know, it's not uh, accurate because this is not innovation in business plans. We need to be real. Um, the Capacity building, I totally agree with, e with each one of you uh, uh, that capacity building, as Mr. Lenz just mentioned, it is through training, uh, give them the mentorship within your company, give them the startup and let them uh, go by themselves whenever they need help. Um, I grew up to see my father doing this uh, at personal level and really we need workshops. Please consider doing workshops, particularly for at universities, take it at personal level, give even one day in a year for youth how to do things, not to wait for them to come to you, but please go to them and show them how to do this, even for scientists. <coughs> in laboratories, how to do, just give us your knowledge. I learned from 30 minutes from you what is needed, you know, like to read books and books. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Highness. Uh, we have room for one more question, please. Uh, will you please? Thank you. Um, my name is Togozani. I am from South Africa at the University of Technology, Central University of, Te of Technology in South Africa in Bloemfontein. I just want to find out, especially from Dr. Lin, you mentioned that you come from also a, a university. What are some of the sort of typical challenges why universities fail to attract funding for their innovative ideas? I mean, as an example, uh, back at our university, um, we've got someone has developed a technology, it's basically 3D printing, where they can print uh, <coughs> like, a, like let's say you lost a, an ear, let's say in an accident, a fire accident or something, they can print that. Or like let's say you're in a car accident, you lost like a jaw or something, they can 3D print that. I mean, that's, that's good technology. But they, there is no funding to sort of scale that up. Why could, why, why is that? Should I take that, so right now? Okay, um, the very first thing about university is that you have to understand that university, how is it being measured, what is their success? It is not about innovation. University job is to teach students, and university is about playing a ranking exercise. Right, so it's a how many paper you publish, okay? How many research have you ever done? How much research grant have you gotten? It's nothing about commercialization. So when you start measuring that, university is a place to start discovering and understand new knowledge, whether the knowledge is useful or not. Innovation, on the other hand, is turning knowledge into value. You need to have value first. So if there's no value, it's not considered innovation, it's just creativity. So when you understand that that is the job of the university, then you, when you go and ask university that can you build something for the mass, the university is typically not interested because it, this is not being measured. So when you understand that the criteria and all these things have a deep understanding of it, it is totally disconnected. So university is not a good place for the entrepreneurship because the professor don't get rewarded 
to start the business. All right. So, so once you understand that, you don't don't go and ask for that. Simply, okay, this is the wrong place. Okay, it's a R and D. So we yeah we study the whole population to understand that the total population there is only about eight percent of people who are entrepreneurial. Eight percent. And you have 71% of people are professional, they are good in solving problem, but they don't like problem. And the 21% of people are leader manager who are able to juggle all these things. Now when you put the 71% of people through a workshop that you suggest to talk about entrepreneurship, their interest for entrepreneurship dies. They will hate you. <laughs> but you play with the 8%, send them for workshop, they love it, and they become better, better entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's just, you really have to understand the psychology of the people first. That is what you do. Okay? Yes. Exactly. So I am I'm, I'm used to writing paper, right? Four hundred over papers, okay? Mostly published in the real one. So the, the things I understand the scientist mentality, but I'm also an entrepreneur, so I'm a, a hybrid for that matters. So what we did is that in the SDG example, as I mentioned about it, they start looking at the problem. They see the problem, but being a young people, they don't know how to solve it. So we bring them to see the scientists. And the scientists say, okay, this is how you can solve it. This is easily done this way. This is a pattern you can use, da, da, da. And then they take the thing and continue. Right? So this is the business model, exactly. I think uh, Rene will, will, will share the same thing also. That this is looking at the business first, then you find the technology to fit it. So we are talking about this one called solution, uh, problem looking for solution. It's easier. But a solution looking for a problem can be quite difficult. So example that you gave is that a printing a year. The question is that who need that? How many people need that? How big is the market? Can people live without a year? The answer is yes. So who are the people who really need that? How big the market is will determine whether they get the money to com commercialize. Yeah. And, uh, it's not that, about the that technology. Is very insightful. Mo Motosem, I know Rene is really keen to go, so maybe he can wrap up quickly and then we can go to the next panel. Yeah, actually, we we have 30 seconds for you. Okay. One yes. left. I'm sorry. You seem super keen, so you got to go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, researchers used to uh, part or start in the lab to create some uh, marbles and very uh, wonderful product to the market. The startups start in the market and go to the lab. That is the way. And for universities, I think when the education go to the revenue, educate people to, to generate revenue, maybe we can work together, researchers and, and, and startups. I, I think I, I totally agree with Mr. Lin because absolutely different the, the, the way. I'm a professor 20, 23 years ago, and, and I understand the universities, and it's very, very different the, the, the way. Sure. Entrepreneurs, don't go to universities, please. Just do your business and create and create the capacities just yeah, to learning and, sure. and, and thank you, building. Doctor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right, absolutely. Thank you. I have to conclude now. Or Matthew will kill me if I continue. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to thank our panelists. Dr. Lin, Apollo Andrews, Rene Raz, and Murus Nusara, our moderator. Well done, sir. I know you've got one of your colleagues, Matt Gamser, was in the room for the presentation. I'm sure he's going to take the word back to Washington about what a great job you did. All right. Thank you very much. Fantastic.